Hallelujah. 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 God bless you. You who are going to watch live and you who are going to watch the replay again, you're coming with me on a journey of discovering the kingdom of God that we live in and that lives in us. So get out your Bibles, get out your pencil, get out your notebook and make notes. And listen, there is a revival across the land. There was a prophecy by Bob Jones sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s, sometime around then, he kept repeating it, that when the chiefs win against the eagles, a great revival will break out. Well, Sunday, for the first time, the chief won against the eagles. And I want to tell you, there's a great revival breaking out. There's one at Asbury College in Kentucky, where all the colleges have now come. People from around the world already have come. People are hungry for God. This is the time when we realize that what we had before can't carry us through. We need to understand this God we serve, this God who lives in us. We need a change in our minds and our hearts. Romans fourteen seventeen says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And in that chapter, there was an argument about meats, about who shouldn't take this. And, and this is where Paul told them, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. Whether you eat or eat not, you do it unto the Lord. What the kingdom of God is, it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that word righteousness in the Greek is dikaiosone, dikaiosone. And it means a condition that's acceptable to God. Are you living in a condition that's acceptable to God? It says righteousness, dekayosune, is a doctrine concerning the way in which man may attain a state approved of God. It's integrity, virtue, purity of life. Rightness, correctness of thinking, of feeling, of acting. It's justice or virtue which gives each person his due. Righteousness, that's what the kingdom of God is about. It's about peace. And the Greek for peace is irene. The Hebrew for peace is shalom, but the Greek that is used here in Romans 4.17 is irene, and it's a state of national tranquility. It's a state when we can see cities, when we can see nations live in a state of peace. That's not been the case for so long. There's so much turmoil in the government. So much turmoil in politics. It's a state of national tranquility. It's exemption from the rage and the havoc of war. It's peace between individuals, harmony and concord. It's security, safety, prosperity, felicity. Because peace and harmony make and keep things safe and prosperous. It's peace of the Messiah. 
It's the way that leads to peace, salvation. It's a tranquil state of soul. A tranquil state of our soul that is assured of its salvation through Christ. So it fears nothing from God. Have no fear. They have a healthy fear of the Lord and awe, a respect, an honor. They're not afraid of what God would do because they're walking in his ways. They're walking in rightness. So it's that contentment that whatever is going on around us, we can live a devout and upright way. And then joy. Hara. Hara. It's cheerfulness. Calm, delight, gladness. Are you living, experiencing such a state? Are you living in a state of righteousness, peace, and joy? I'm not talking about the absence of struggles. That will ever be present as long as the enemy is on this earth. But I'm talking about a state on the inside of you. Because the Holy Ghost lives in you. Because the kingdom of God lives in you. It's like Job said when he was going through so much anguish. He says, though he slays me, yet will I trust. It's that state of knowing that your God has a plan. We don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why this is happening. But I have an assurance. What do do you default to when things don't go your way? Like if you hammer your your thumb by accident, what do you say? Does cuss words come out? Has that state on the inside of you made its change? Have you allowed the kingdom of God to take over? Do you default to righteousness? Do you default to peace? Do you default to joy? Hey, I'm not saying there's not going to be troubles. It's like when I came into the sanctuary today, the pastor that owns the building said to me, we had the best service we've ever had Sunday, and then the pipes broke in the toilet, but it's not an easy break. They don't know where the break is, so they got to strip everything out and put cameras. He said he was up so long, and finally the Lord said to him, after he was up wondering how this is going to get fixed, the Lord said, why are you still up? It's like a novel pastor I heard of, their pipes broke, and it's going to cost thousands of dollars to fix it. Do you think God said, oh my gosh, look what just happened? No. He knew this was going to happen from the foundations of the earth. And he has the answer. He is the answer. So instead of us worrying and struggling and losing our peace and losing our joy and then living in unrighteousness to find ways that are illegal to fix our problem, we just rest in God. We just rest in this God this King of Kings, and this Lord of Lords that we serve, knowing that he is a good God, knowing he's a king who has our best interests at heart. So, as kingdom citizens, as people of God, who've entered into the kingdom through the door, Jesus, and the kingdom has entered into them, we have to work at allowing the Holy Ghost in us to bring us to that state of peace, that state of joy, and to help us walk in righteousness. Our default must be righteousness. Our default must be peace. The kids are getting on your nerve. Go in a corner and pray. Don't cuss them out. 
Because then they come to school and guess what they do? The same thing they see and hear you do. And then we tell them, you're not allowed to curse. Like one girl told me one year when I was teaching her like a few years ago. She's probably a grown woman. I would love to meet her and see how she's doing. I said, do you speak to your mom that way? She says, sure we do. She says, we cuss each other out and call the police on each other. No, that is not the way of the kingdom of God. That's the way of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the earth. Our default, again, must be righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We have to allow it to work in us. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a it's a practice. Like the chief and the eagles, they didn't just wake up one morning and decide, I'm going to play this game today. No. They've been in practice and practice and practice and practice to perfect their game. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. We have to practice. We have to cultivate walking in peace. Every time that thing comes up, we have to remember what the, thus says the Lord. The Holy Spirit will remind us. And this is the importance of reading the word. The Holy Spirit will bring a scripture to you. Cast all your care on me, for I care for you. Peace, joy, righteousness. That's what's in us. And that's what should come out of us. This morning as I did my Bible study, I think it was yesterday, I moved a little bit further today in Matthew, and Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were asking him, why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? They were walking through the field, so they plucked the corn and was eating it. And of course they didn't wash their hands. So the disciples were upset. And Jesus said to them, It's not what comes, I'm sorry, it's not what goes into you that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. Because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. He says, In your heart comes things like murder and strife and lying and dishonesty and that's what Paul said be not deceived a kingdom citizen must never be named as dishonest as fornicating as not paying their tithes as mean-spirited and hey I'm not talking about correcting somebody in a stern way, and they don't like it, so they says you're mean. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking mean, unloving, cruel. I'm not talking about correcting a wrong. You're going to be corrected in ways you don't like. That's not what I'm talking about. First Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. I'm here to tell you today. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. We live in a superior kingdom, and a superior kingdom lives inside of us. And therefore, we've got to cultivate, practice habits of righteousness, peace, and joy. It must become a default. Daniel 2.44, and write this down, and look at this, prophesied way before Jesus came. It said in Daniel chapter 2, 44, in the time of those kings, 
he'd given a prophecy of what he saw. And he said, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but itself will endure forever. That is the kingdom we live in. That's the kingdom that lives in us. So last week, I talked about entering that kingdom by believing in Jesus and he's the door and once we enter into the door Jesus the kingdom immediately enters into us we are translated from the kingdom of darkness the kingdom of the earth into God's superior kingdom where we're ruled by the king of kings and the lord of lords who live in heaven and his rule is total, complete. It's not a republic where we can vote. No, it's not. We are no more citizens of earth. The Bible says we're just pilgrims, strangers passing through. We, in, we dwell in an earthly body. This earthly body that when we die goes into the ground and the spirit goes back to God and the spirit is waiting for that day when the body will be re reunited but we'll have a new body. This kingdom that we live in, God made a covenant with all the kingdom citizens. A covenant that we had no part in except to say, I do. He sealed it with the blood of Jesus and then paid it with the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then he commissioned us to go out and do the same. And he didn't leave us without an example. As we look in the Gospels, we see how Jesus came from heaven to colonize, to take over, to bring that kingdom that extends on the earth through us. He showed us how. So this kingdom that we live in is a superior kingdom. It's in us. That means we have all the, 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 the nourishment all the power, all the authority that we need to live right. This kingdom ruled by the sovereign king is like any kingdom that has a covenant, constitution, principles, laws, a royal army, except it's a superior kingdom over all other kingdoms and it will crush every kingdom in the end. We, as his royal citizens, must live by his principles. And let me tell you something. We don't get to vote. When we go to vote in our republic, it has things on it that says, do you agree that the lottery should be used for education? Yes or no. Do you believe that this should be and this should be? We don't get to vote. We do not get to vote. Do you want to vote for this person or this person or this person to be the congresswoman? No. We don't get to vote. God made these laws. God made these principles. And we either follow them or we don't. What's a principle? It's a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. Simply put, a principle is a kind of rule, a belief or idea that guides you. 
You can also say a good ethical person has a lot of principles. In general, it's some kind of basic truths that help you with your life. And so we want to talk about the constitution of the kingdom. The constitution, just like the one that many countries make, the kingdom of heaven has a constitution. It's a body of fundamental principles or established precedents according to to which a state or other organization is acknowledged to be governed by. Every kingdom has principles, laws, edicts to live by. It's impossible not to. Jesus said a kingdom divided against itself will soon fall, and the kingdom of God will never fall. That's why Jesus' last prayer in John chapter 17, was that we will unite in one with him and the Father, like the Father and him are united. As we become one in him, understanding his principles are not to harm us. A kingdom divided against itself will soon fall. Our king, our king of kings, his principles, his laws, his edicts are non-negotiable. They are non-negotiable. Like when I'm giving out incentives, we have a store, a little store on Thursday. The kids do well. They get little tickets they can use as dollars and shop in the store. And when they get to the store, they want to negotiate. They want to negotiate well. I know I've behaved bad, and this thing costs $10, and I only have six. Non-negotiable. You're supposed to behave and get your work done, and if you behave and get your work done, you get paid dollars, pretend dollars that you can spend in my store on Thursday. It's simple. Behave, do your work. Everybody's supposed to do that. The kingdom of God, his rule, his principles are non-negotiable. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light. We are supposed to show forth by our righteousness, by our peace, by our joy. And I'm not talking about joy being this silly foolishness. No, it's this, this calm that lets us know that we're not moved by what we see or think. We're not sad and depressed. If we do get sad or depressed, we figure it out with the Lord. Why am I sad? Why am I depressed? And we cast that thing on him and we pull on him and his truth and his power. So we're supposed to shine as lights. We're the salt of the earth. But this is what I want you to hear in what Jesus said that will shine some light. Matthew 5, 16. I just read to you. Let's go to 17. Matthew 5 verse 17. A lot of people said, well, we're not supposed to follow the commandments because that's the Old Testament. That is hogwash. That's not what Jesus came to destroy. Listen to verse 17 of Matthew 5. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Jesus came to fulfill it, not to destroy it. 
Here's what he says in verse 18 of Matthew 5. I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. When we're saying that we're not supposed to follow the Old Testament laws, that's not what the book of God says. Now, we're not supposed to follow the doctrines of men, the traditions of men, like Jesus was saying to the Pharisees when they said, why didn't your disciples wash their hand? They had this big washing ceremony. You can't do this, you can't do that until you wash your hands. And you understand perfectly what I'm talking about. Because during 2020, the big deal everywhere was wash your hand, wash your hand, even showed you how to wash your hand. The Bible says this, Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 19. If anyone shall break one of the least of the commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach, do and teach the commandments, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. His laws stands. His edict stands. It's how we get to walk this life. We can't walk this life without laws. Somebody says, and I've heard several people say, oh, this is the New Testament. So we're not supposed to follow the laws. We're supposed to like like for instance don't give 10% tithe no we're supposed to give you know much more but do you that's a lie you're just using an excuse not to do the right thing 10 is the rule the church did not make it up the pastors did not make it up god instituted it in Matthew 16, verse 6, Jesus said, and this is what he, we're talking about when he says, we don't follow the Old Testament doctrines of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 16, 6, beware of the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious doctrines and traditions of men. And that's in Ma and, and also in Matthew 15:3, I just told you when they were grumbling about why didn't the Pharisees, why didn't the disciples wash their hands? It says in Matthew 15:3, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You telling me that my disciples ought to wash their hands before they eat, but you, you, you transgress God's commandment in favor of your traditions, which is right. Your traditions are God's commandments. It's a superior kingdom. It's a superior kingdom. And we, the church, we're still doing what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did, making up our own doctrines. Like, for instance, women can't wear makeup. Sometimes I need a little makeup. I need me a little makeup sometimes. Women can't do this. Women can't do that. That's tradition. The Bible says nothing about it. That we can't. It says don't focus on it. Don't let your garb be focused on how you look, how you dress, and you're living like hell. But it should be an inner lifestyle you're focusing on. Let's look at the commandments, the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other God before me. How is that done away with? You shall have no other God. The ones who says that that's done away with are the ones who are serving other gods. They're serving the God of money. They're serving the God of sex. 
They're serving the God of lies. You shall have no other God before me. That stands and will continue to stand. It says, you shall not make any graven images. In other words, don't bow down to no image calling it God. That stands. People still do that to this day. He says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And oh my goodness, people use God's name as a cuss word all the time. No, you should not do it. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Oh, I don't have to go to church. Well, hey, it's a command. And Jesus says, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot of the law will be done away with. He said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. And that's the only commandment with a promise. But if you honor your father and your mother, your days on earth will be long. I want you to stop and think. Why are all our young people getting shot? Why are all these things happening? Check it out. Check their lives out. Yes, it's wrong that they got shot. But they did something that their parents told them not to do, went somewhere. Their parents told them not to go. They know in their heart they shouldn't do. It cuts your life just because of disobedience, not God doing it. But he knows that if you disobey, you're going in the wrong path, in a path where you're not protected. You shall not kill. How is that done away with? Because that's done away with in too many people's hearts and minds, we've got the shooting, just had a shooting in the college again. Just killings and murderings for nothing. You should not commit adultery. Oh, yeah, that's the old. So we got Christian marriages that are breaking up just like the world's marriages. And one of the main causes is adultery. It's like somebody I spoke with last night. I was telling them about this great revival in Ashbury. And they brought up the fact that yeah the last revival they had in Brownsville the pastor cheated on his wife why is it that that has to be evident amongst God's people it's because in our minds oh we're living the New Testament we don't have to live according to God's laws thou shalt not steal this is a time of income tax how tempting it is to lie the next one thou shalt not lie thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor stop saying you see some people are not afraid to tell a lie and the final one number 10 you shall not covet that word covet is the Hebrew Hamad and it means to delight to desire to lust after something that's not your own don't covet your neighbor's house don't covet your neighbor's wife don't covet your neighbor's servant don't covet your neighbor's ox don't covet your neighbor's ass don't covet anything that's your neighbor's how many of us do that you go over to Susie's house oh man She's got such a nice thing on her wall. I wish I had it. And how many marriages break break up? And the best friend is, is, is the one who the husband is now with. Or the best friend is the one who the wife is now with. Coveting. So those laws have not changed. When Jesus came... <clears throat> when when Jesus came, what he did was to divide the commandments into two groups. Those same ten commandments, he div he he divided them into two main groups. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first 
and great commandment. And the first four falls under that. No other God before him. No graven images. Do not take his name in vain. And honor your, I'm sorry, and, and honor the Sabbath day. Those four fall under love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The first great commandment. And he said, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's where the next six commandments come in. Honoring your mother and father, who is your neighbor, is that one next to you, wherever you are. Honor your mother and father. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. So those, those vertical four commandments, and the six horizontal ones, Jesus just broke it up into two main headings. He says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything else can be fitted into those two headings. Jesus himself further broke down those commandments. And you can see from... Matthew 4, all the way, we can see 50 commands, around 50 commands Jesus give. So first we've got God's 10 commandments. Then Jesus broke it down into two main headings. And then those were further broken down into 50 commandments. And I put a link when I go home, I'll put a link in the description where the 50 commandments, I don't have time to go into it and read it. Those 50 commandments, you can go and read them. They have all the scriptures where they are. Let me look at a couple right quick. Don't have time to read them all. But one of them says, one of God, one of the commandments broken down, Jesus said, in Matthew 7:21 and Luke 6:46, do not call me Lord and you don't obey me. That's the command Jesus said, don't call me Lord when you don't obey me. Here's another one. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And that's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Here's another one. Be salt and light of this world. Here's another one. Don't swear an oath. Amen. So these are the... Hello. Hi. I want to welcome you. I am I'm recording the message right now. No. So, I want to go now to, to Psalm 19. And I love Psalm 19 because it gives us an idea of how, how listen, I have discovered how sweet God's law is. Listen, like I tell the children that I teach, going through four years, five years of college was difficult, especially as a single parent. But one of the things I love is that, like, since the 10th or the 11th, our paycheck was in the bank. Even though we don't get paid till the 15th, our paycheck was already in the bank. And I don't have to worry at night about the police coming and getting me. There's such peace in keeping God's laws. Such peace. Let's look at Psalm 19. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Listen, God's testimony who he says he is. 
you can take it to the bank. It's sure. It's secure. If God says it, whether you believe it or not, it is so. His testimony is sure. It makes the simple wise. The statutes of the Lord are right. It rejoices the heart. The commandments of the Lord, it's pure. It enlightens the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They're more to be desired than gold. Yes than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. Listen, God will warn you when trouble is coming. God, there's so many things God warned me of. It's just amazing. In the word. Verse 12 of Psalm 19, who can understand his errors? Sometimes we can't. We don't even want to admit it. So we got to cry out to the Holy Spirit, cleanse me from secret faults. Those hidden secret things. There are things in me every now and then that the Lord showed that I didn't realize was still in me. They were still in me and they keep you back from moving forward. It's like a wound that is open. And you let the flies come and land on it. And you let the water from the toilet fall on it. And you prevent it from healing. And so those wounds on the inside of us, those secret things that sometimes we don't want anybody to touch. It's like if my hand is hurt, and I'm at work. I don't want anybody to come by my hand. I'm protecting it. But you have to not protect your wounds. You have to give them to the Lord that he can cleanse them. He can go into those secret hidden places. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God's principles, he, he made them so that we, his people, can live in righteousness, joy, and peace. Here's one principle in Mark 10, 6. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That's God's principle. We can't change it. We can go and get an operation. We can put different garbs on. We can make up our face and put a wig on. It doesn't change what God did how he birthed you. It doesn't change it at all. All we're doing, Romans chapter 1 tells us, is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. From the beginning, God made creation. He made male and female. Colossians 2.10 says, We are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. We, when we realize this, when we understand it, then those things of darkness that try to overcome us will realize they have no power or authority over us. In fact, we have power and authority over it. Because the Bible says in Colossians 2.10, we are complete in him who's the head of all principality in power, the head of all principality and power lives inside of us, and we live in his kingdom. So who can harm us? And that's what Paul says in Romans 8, 
What can separate me from the love of God? Nothing. Colossians 1, 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which made us meet to partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He, he made us to be partakers. He made us meet. He made the way for us to be partakers. Verse 13 of Colossians 1, he delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It says, he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of every creature. And for him, by him, were all things created that are in the heaven, in the earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he lives in us. How can we say we have no control over our mouths? That we just got to give somebody a piece of our mind. How? How can we say we can't keep our zipper up? If so be the case, then you are not in the kingdom. You're not living by the kingdom principles. And I wonder if the kingdom is even in you. You could be suppressing it. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. By God, this Jesus, all things were made by him. All things consist of him. He's the head. It says he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. This God who lives in us has preeminence over everything. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, he made peace. The kingdom of God is peace. He made peace through the blood of his cross, so that by him all things can be reconciled to himself, that by him, whether things be of the earth or the things of heaven, they can be reconciled to him by him. He did it on the cross. And you and me, were sometimes alienated and enemies in our mind by wicked works. But now we're reconciled. We're reconciled in the body of his flesh through his death so he can present us, listen, so he can present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And that's why we live by his principles. That's why he established his principles. But not only did he establish his principles, he gave us himself to live in us, to empower us. He gave us his manual to teach us. Oh, children of the living God, we have to understand. We need to be presented before him as a holy bride. If we're not, we're going to be kicked out. It says if we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which is being preached to you, which was preached to you. It says every creature which is under the heaven, it was preached to. That's a sovereign edict. Let me tell you, let me end with this. Matthew 13, 24. 
Jesus gave a parable of a man to explain the kingdom of heaven. He said the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom we're in and it is in us, is like this. A man sowed good seed in his field, but while he slept, the enemy came and sowed tears among his wheat and then went his way. And it says, when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then the tares also appeared. And the servant of the householder said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? Where did these tares come from? And the householder says, An enemy has done this. And the servant says, Shall we go out and gather them up? And the householder says, Nah, don't. Let's as you pull the tears up, you also uproot the wheat. What does this mean? That some who are not of the kingdom are amongst us. And we were warned, if you read your Bible, Jude talks about it. Those who creep in unawares. Here's what Jesus said in the parable, verse 30. Verse 30 of Matthew 13. Let them grow together. Let the wheat and the, the tear grow together until harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares, bind them up in bundles to burn them. Then gather the wheat into my barn. The disciple says, tell us what does the parable mean? He says, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. That's God himself. The field the seed was sown in is the world. Good seed, the wheat, are the children of the kingdom. Listen to that. The good seed, the wheat, are the children of the kingdom. Are you good seed? Are you walking in righteousness? If not, repent. Repent. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. This is Jesus speaking, not me. I'm just reading what Jesus said. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. And that's the end of my message today. And I pray that we hear what the Spirit says. We have to follow His principles. His principles are made by Him. We have no rights in the kingdom. We follow the King's principles. They are non-negotiable. As we follow His principles, we end up reaping the benefits. He takes care of His own. When we walk in righteousness, peace, and joy, which is the principles of the kingdom, then we have our needs met, which I'm going to talk about Sunday. Next week, I'll talk to you about our position in the kingdom. Oh, God is so good. We need to understand our position and stop using silly excuses. The devil don't mind if we use those excuses. He doesn't want us to understand. Some of these messages, Facebook refused to promote. They denied and rejected it. And I was like, why would Facebook reject these messages? The enemy doesn't want the truth to go out. But you cannot stop the truth. The word of God is not bound. The only people who are not going to receive the truth are those who don't want to hear it. If you go back and read Psalm 19, it says God's voice, his word has gone out over the entire earth in every language. 
There is no excuse. There's going to be no excuse in the end. Amen? Before I go, I want to try. I say try because I hear names and I write it down, but I never hear what God wants to say. So it's as if I'm on demand. I'm on demand to say what God is saying about these names. So, Father, help me. So, the names I have today, oops, I've got to get back to it. The names, let me see if I can speak. I have Gina, Percy, Pilgrim, Megan, and Francis. Hallelujah, Father. Let's pray, because we didn't pray. And I want to ask the Holy Spirit to speak through me. So easy. I've already prayed and asked him. And now I'm praying aloud so you can hear. Father, speak through me by the power of your spirit to Gina and Percy and Pilgrim and Megan and Francis. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Gina, when I see you, I see you as a child from a single parent home. Your mother struggled to raise you and your siblings. But she tried to teach you what the truth is. She tried to teach you how to walk in the truth. The truth is already in you. And God said, Gina, this is not time to follow the giddy multitude. This is not time to go looking for things that will never satisfy you. Gina, you know that you were created for me. You know you were created to honor God. He says that you can look all around the world and you'll never find what you're looking for because it's not around the world. It's in Christ. It's not in another woman, Gina. It's not in a man. It's not in things. It's in Christ. It's in God. It's in his kingdom. So, Gina, God said, before it's too late, come back to him. And I've got a feeling this is not the first time you're hearing this. Listen, if he's repeating himself, it means look out. It's serious. He loves you enough to reach out. He cannot force you. God cannot violate his own will. He cannot. You have to choose. You have to choose him, Gina. Percy. When, when I said Percy, it suddenly gave me a picture of my great uncle Percy riding a bicycle down the street. God said, Percy, you are faithful. You will do whatever it takes to get the job done. And God said, that is what my kingdom looks like. He says, but Percy, you need to begin to get wisdom from me, from the word of God through the Holy Spirit. You need to begin digging into this word. Don't do it without the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a teacher. There are hidden secrets in this book, Percy. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to God, but when they're revealed, and the Holy Spirit will reveal it, like I said, if you ask, if you knock, if you seek, if you're serious, He'll reveal secrets to you. And He said those secrets are not just for you. They're for your children and your children's children to forever until Christ comes. This book is full of secrets. Secrets of how to get rich. Secrets of how to be healed. Secrets of how to walk righteously. There are so many secrets in this Bible. And he wants to give it to you. He wants to give it to all of us. But we need to want it. We need to hunger and thirst for it. He can't treat his word like swine's food, pilgrim, 
they call you pilgrim because when you were just a little kid, you would just, like they say, jet. Whatever was going on, you would just get up and go, get up and leave. And God said, pilgrim, this is a time when you need to come on a journey with me. He said, this is a time where you need to exercise that habit of getting up and walking out of things that don't benefit you. He says, Pilgrim, you've leaned your ear lately for too long to those things that satisfy not. And it's time that you get up and realize that you're just a pilgrim in this world. In other words, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you and you belong to the kingdom of heaven. You don't belong to the earth. You're just a stranger passing through pilgrim. And you need to realize it. You need to learn it. You need to walk in it. Megan, God's got a mission for you. Megan, God says, I have a mission for you. You've longed for a husband. And God said in Isaiah 54, 5, I, the Lord, am your husband. And I want to tell you, sweetheart, him being a husband, you'll never want for anything. You'll never want for anything. Don't be fooled by sexual desires. Don't be fooled by it. Sexual desires are only stirred up when we allow it to be stirred up. We can shut it up, tell it shut up, and don't encourage it, Megan. Don't encourage it by the things you watch. Don't encourage it by the things you listen to. Don't encourage it by the underwear that you wear. Don't encourage it by the thoughts that come in your mind. Don't encourage it by masturbation. Megan, God said, I'm your husband. I've got a job for you to do, and time is running out while you long for that which satisfies not. When you long for things like that, when you finally go and get it, you're going to find it's not what you think it ought to be. That reminds me, I was in a choir one day, and this lady said, yeah, when I married my husband, and that first night I said, this is what it is. This is all there is to it. When you learn to put God first, Megan, the husband that he will send to you, you will complement each other. Sex for a woman is never good if the man that she's been in, if she's indulging in doesn't love on her. The only reason that she's got to fake it. The only reason that sex is good for a woman who doesn't have a man that loves her is if she's given herself over to lust. And she's living by lust. For lust, and that's the kingdom of darkness. That's the kingdom of this world. That's not who you are, Megan. So stop worrying about your needs not being met on the earth, and look at all that God is doing for you and has done for you, and turn before it's too late. Francis, I don't know if you're a guy, Francis, because my spelling looks like a, 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 a man's with the, the 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 letters, but it could be a woman also. Francis, God loves you. And he says, you've been blind for too long. It's time you get serious and come to me and let me wash your eyes. Like he told the Christian, the churches, Buy eye salve for your eyes. Francis, turn to God before it's too late. It's not too late right now. But there's a time, there's an expiration date on anything. Time is running out. The only thing that's not going to expire is God's word because God's word is who he is. So Francis, get with the Lord. For all those who you all those who are watching, remember 
there's a spirit of Christ in all prophecy. And that means if I give a prophecy to somebody, you grab a hold of it. You grab a hold of it, especially if it touches and, and, and touches that spirit in you, touches if you and the Holy Spirit bears witness to it. Just because I give a name to it, I give a name because God has a, a, a specific for that person, but it's for you also. So be encouraged. Get, get to understand this kingdom living and this kingdom that's living in us. And stop dwelling as earth dwellers. My grandma used to say this thing all the time. You go to crab dance, you're bound to get mud. Listen to that again. You go to crab dance, you're bound to get mud. And you know, we, we as children always had these pictures in our mind of the crab dancing. But what she simply means is, if you're going to hang in those places where the crabs are, don't expect to come away without mud on your clothes. Don't expect to come away without looking like you've been where the crabs are. Who are you hanging with? Who are you hanging with? Who are you listening to in 2023? It's important who you listen to. Some of you need to shut the door on some of those friends. You need to confront them and let them know, listen, I can't live this way. I can't indulge in you anymore. And some of those friends may be not a person, but maybe things like like cigarette smoking and lying. Shut the door on those friends. They're from your past, and they need to stay dead in your past. Amen? It's time for us to walk in the kingdom principles, which is righteousness, peace and joy but you've got to listen to this it's in the holy ghost he's the one that provides it we can't do this alone if we could have done it alone jesus would have never had to come and die but we couldn't do it alone all of this that he's done must be revealed by the holy spirit who is fully god but who's here to teach us the kingdom principles through this word. Amen? Should he say the same? I will speak with you Sunday, and we'll talk about seeking first the kingdom of God. And next Thursday, we'll talk about our position in the kingdom, unless God changes it. God bless you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lydia. I love you, Aunt Eslyn. I will talk with you soon. Be blessed. Be encouraged, be prosperous in the Lord. Amen.